All right, so we're going to have that afternoon session starting now. Uh, speakers Ryan O'Donnell will be telling us about uh, analysis of Boolean functions. OK, hello. Uh, thanks for coming. <coughs> thanks to the organizers also for inviting me here. Um, right, so I'm going to talk about a uh, very basic introduction to Fourier analysis of Boolean functions. Uh, so that's the topic. Uh, if you want to see some more, you can go to this web address. I wrote a book about the subject, and you can download it for free if you go here. Uh, okay, so we're going to be talking about um, Boolean functions, kind of also a, a topic that came up in Ben's talk. Uh, so I'll really stick to Boolean like true or false for a moment. So a Boolean function takes n uh, Boolean inputs that are false or true and outputs also false or true. And for a given Boolean function, there are many different ways to represent it. So I mean, you could represent it by um, uh, its truth table of size 2 to the n. You can represent it by like an English language description. You can represent it by a circuit or a formula. Here's an example here. It's an extremely simple circuit with just one gate. Um, or you can represent it by uh, a decision tree. So that's something that um, Ben talked about in his talk. So here's a picture of a decision tree also, uh, computing a small Boolean function. So there are many different uh, representations. This is the, um, I'll call this the AND function. It's a simple one. And I'll write a subscript AND to denote that it has arity N. Um, and also, I'll typically be writing um, X like this that stands for a vector of inputs X1 up to Xn. Uh, OK. So uh, this is the AND function. Actually, does anybody recognize what function this is representing? If I drew it correctly? What's that? Yeah, it's the majority function on 3. So this is a 3 input function. I'll call it majority sub 3. Uh, of x, although x is really only x1, x2, x3. But uh, if you look carefully, I mean, it rep outputs true if a majority of the three inputs are true, and it outputs false if a majority of them are false. OK, great. So there are different representations of uh, Boolean functions. And uh, actually, Fourier analysis of Boolean functions is all about one particular representation that we haven't seen yet. And it's about the representation of uh, Boolean functions as polynomials. But in particular, because I think this will be a little bit different from how Srikanth will talk about polynomials tomorrow, uh, it's representing them as real polynomials, so polynomials with real coefficients. Okay, so that's what Fourier analysis is all about, just representing Boolean functions as real polynomials. And uh, because of this, it inspires one particular um, change of notation, which is very annoying the first few times you see it, but I'm afraid we're going to make it. It's, uh, it's going to bother you, but we'll have to get used to it. So instead of writing true as false as f and t, we won't do that. We also won't use 0 and 1, although that would be a common convention. But we're going to make this like terrifying notational switch Oops. where we're going to use plus and minus 1, thus it over the real numbers. And just to make it more annoying, I'll do it in the less obvious way. So false will be plus 1, and true will be minus 1. Um, Okay. So actually, the convention of using plus or minus 1 thought of as real numbers is quite important for analysis of Boolean functions. Whether you call this one false or true and this one false and true it doesn't really matter. Uh, but just to annoy you a little bit, I'm going to stick with this. Okay, so that already takes a little while to get used to. So it means we have to change everything up here. Like this uh, will be uh, plus 1 and minus 1. And the outputs will also be plus or minus 1. Okay. So really, we should uh, change all of these. I'm, I guess I won't do it, but like, we'll have to change all these to like minus 1. This should be plus, wait, also minus 1, plus 1, et cetera. I guess this will also be minus 1, minus 1, plus 1. OK. All right, so that's the most difficult part of this talk. OK, so uh, as I said, uh, and also Boolean functions is all about representing Boolean functions as polynomials. And let's see how we can actually do that with some specific examples. So the first thing I want to show you is um, this. How can we cook up a polynomial that represents this very simple function, the AND function of n uh, bits? Uh, OK, so just sort of think about it for a second and make it up uh, on the spot. 
Um, we kind of want to test if all the bits are negative 1. So it seems like a good idea. I don't know if this is going to work well. OK, that's fine. It seems like a good idea to uh, maybe look at a half minus a half times x1. So that's going to be um, 1 if x1 is true and 0 otherwise. And then I could multiply it by a half minus a half x2. So again, uh, 1 if x2 is true and 0 if it's false. And I could do this for all the input bits. And um, this is all over the real. So this kind of almost gets close to the answer. This is almost doing the right thing, because if you multiply together all of these quantities, uh, it'll be, this whole thing will be um, 1 if, well, if the all inputs are true. And 0 else. So that's, uh, actually, that's what we normally think of the, like, the output of the AND function being. It's just that it didn't quite satisfy our convention that it should be plus and minus 1. But we're almost there. And uh, actually, it'll be convenient to know this anyway. So let me, let me put some notation. I'll call this AND sub N of x, maybe superscript 0, 1, just to say that we're not quite there. Uh, this is the expression that outputs uh, 1 if the AND is true and 0 if it's false. OK, so then uh, if we really want to represent the AND function properly with this plus or minus 1 convention, well, that's not too hard. We can say that AND sub N of x, we just need to change this 1 and 0 to plus or minus 1. So we can write um, 1 minus 2 times AND 0, 1 sub N of x. So finally, this expression, when you plug in you know, a bunch of plus or minus ones, you'll get out the answer plus or minus one for the end. Any questions about this? Should add, you know, if you have a question, don't even put up your hand, just shout it out. OK, so for example, um, let me just, for full clarity, do this in the case of n, e n equals 2. If I just uh, take these first two terms, expand it all out, and also plug it into this 1 minus 2, et cetera, it'll end up looking like this. Half. And this is something we'll want to always do, ex sort of expand everything out so it looks like a nice polynomial. Okay. So finally, this is like the polynomial representation of the AND function on two bits. And you can see it works, right? I mean, if you plug in x1 and x2 to be minus 1, you get a half minus a half minus a half minus a half, which is negative 1, which is true. And if you plug in uh, some plus or minus 1s that aren't both positive 1, then it'll come out to um, 1, which represents false. Uh, OK, so we uh, saw here how you can represent the AND function as a polynomial. Now let's say we want to represent um, this function as a polynomial, this thing that was majority of 3 bits. Should that be minus 1 or 0? Where, where? Uh, the output of the AND function here is equal to 1 or is it 0? Here it's equal to 1 if they're all, all the inputs are minus 1, because each of the terms will be 1. But otherwise it should be it's plus 1. Sorry. This expression, the output is uh, 0 if they're not all minus 1. Because earlier you said that the output of these functions should be mi plus or minus 1. Right, so this, this expression gets us most of the way there. And if we really want the output to be plus or minus 1, then we do this extra little trick. And so this is the final sort of solution. Mm -hmm. But I do want to keep this sort of trick up on the board, because it'll actually help us, let's say, see how to compute a uh, come up with a polynomial that computes this function. So for example, how can we build a polynomial that computes uh, the function represented by this decision tree? Well. Um, yeah, so we want to write some polynomial here that will do this. What we can do, uh, you actually kind of saw a little bit in Ben's talk, we can do it sort of um, leaf by leaf. So we can first try to get the polynomial to do the right thing on this, uh, for this leaf. Okay? So we can look at this path to this leaf, and you see it's actually just an and. It's x1 and x2 are both true. And in that case, the output is minus 1. So what we can do is write down this I'm going to use the 0, 1 representation here of the AND function. 
uh, for x1 and x2. Right, so, so far this gives me an expression which is 1 if x1 and x2 are both negative and 0 otherwise. And then I'm going to multiply it by this leaf value here. This is the leaf value here. Okay, so I'm not done, but so far like this expression sort of gives me the right answer when uh, the truth, when the input is like this. And otherwise it's 0. Which is good, because now I can go on. I can go on to, oh, so that was sort of this branch came here. Now I'm going to make a term for this branch. Okay, so to make a term for this branch, I look at sort of, it's the and that we have x1 is true, x2 is true, and x, sorry, x2 is false, and x3 is true. So that's good. I can take this polynomial expression for and, and I want x1 to be true. I want x2 to be false. That's a little bit of a convenience of using this plus or one or minus notation. To negate x2, I just have to negate it. And x3 should be true. So this sort of is the indicator expression for coming to the leaf on this branch. And the answer here also happened to be minus 1. So I can multiply by that. So I should put a plus here. So let me do one more branch. I'll do this branch. So here I want to and together with sort of 0, 1 output. x1 should be true. x2 is negative. x3 should be negative. And here the final branch outcome is plus 1. Okay, and hopefully you get the picture. I could do this for the other... What's that? Minus, minus 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 oh, thank you, yeah. I wrote the same thing here, yeah. <coughs> okay, so I could do this for the other three branches that we haven't covered. And if I expanded all that out, that would give me a polynomial that really computes the same thing as this decision tree. Right, because uh, exactly one of these expressions will be non-zero for any input x. Any, any questions about that? It's important that it's over the wheels. Yeah, it's definitely important that it's over the reals. Like 100% of the time in this talk, it'll be over reals. Don't think about finite fields or anything. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, then I always, at the end, I would like to expand it all out. And it looks very complicated, but if you expand it all out, I'll tell you what you get. Just, you know, plug this, this the expression in here and so forth. And um, long story short, after many steps, it turns out to be pretty simple. It's this, a half x1 plus a half x2 plus a half x3 minus a half x1, x2, x3. This was majority of three input bits of x. Okay. And you can check for yourself again that this sort of uh, works, right? So I mean, if all three of the inputs are minus one, you'll get minus a half, minus a half, minus a half, plus a half, which gives you the correct majority, minus one. And if, well, I'll leave you to check some other cases and you're on time. Okay, so, you know, as we know, every Boolean function can be, um, has some decision tree representation. I mean, in the worst case, you can just query x1, and then on all the next levels, you can query x2, and all the next level, query x3. Just query all the variables, make a depth and decision tree, and, um, you know, put the appropriate outputs at the leaves. Okay, so for any Boolean function at all, we can first maybe, let's say, make it into a decision tree, and then let's use this procedure to compute it, convert it into a real valued, uh, real polynomial. So let's see, so let's write that as an observation then. So every Boolean function, okay, so that's a generic Boolean function. Um, uh, some decision tree representation. Uh, okay, so it's representable as a real polynomial. And let me make a few additional observations. One observation is that actually, 
It's not clear necessarily why you would care about this, but sometimes you do. Even if the range was not Boolean, but the range was the real numbers, it would still work. Right? Maybe you're not sure exactly why you'd want to study functions whose input is binary strings and whose outputs is reals, but anyway, if you did, then you could just have the same decision tree with real numbers at the leaves rather than just plus or minus one. OK, and then these would just be some arbitrary real numbers, and everything would still work. OK, so if we want to remember that, we, we can remember that as well. Um, another observation that I want to make is, let me stick in another adjective here. Um, it's a multilinear polynomial. Multilinear. OK, and multilinear just means that um, you have no xi squareds and no xi cubed and no xi to the fourth. Just every xi only appears to the power at most one. And um, why is that true? Well, if you just remember how we made like this and zero function, it was just a product of linear terms. So just when you expand it all out, you'll just never get any higher powers of x. And it also makes sense. There's no reason to ever use a higher power of x, right? If you only care about inputs that are always plus or minus 1, then there's no point in ever like squaring it. You could just replace the squared xi with 1. So it, it makes sense that you would only need to use multilinear terms. And um, let me actually, while I'm here, make a sort of side observation, uh, which is that if f, well, I'll use Ben's notation, if the decision tree depth of f is at most k, the polynomial will have degree at most k. Okay, so that's because, I mean, you know, it's the sum of expressions that look like ands of, in this case, at most k variables. Okay, and this is the thing, you multiply together k expressions, so it'll have degree at most k. Okay, so in the, in the general case, if uh, f has a decision tree at most n, because it has at most n variables, then these polynomials will be of degree at most n. Um, OK, so that's nice. So it says that every Boolean function, even a real valued one if you want, can be written as a multilinear real polynomial. OK, and actually, this, I guess, this is the main fact. So let me upgrade this observation to theorem, even though it's not too exciting. And while I'm doing that, I guess I can also add a word here. It has a unique representation. So I just showed you that given any f, it has, I mean, it has a representation like this. And it's a fact that um, there's a unique representation that's multilinear. Okay, so maybe it's not immediately clear because you could have written down different decision trees computing the same function f, but it'll turn out that you'll always get the same polynomial in the end. And um, let me not prove that even though it's uh, easy. Uh, maybe you can think about why. Maybe one thing I can say to, well, I'll say one thing to you in a second that will probably also convince you that this representation is unique. Okay, but this is the main uh, sort of theorem for uh, analysis of Boolean functions. So uh, let's introduce some notation. So what does a generic multilinear polynomial look like? Well, it looks something like this. Okay, so since it's multilinear, multilinear, it's a sum of terms, and each term is a monomial. It's a multilinear monomial, so it's just a product of a subset of the x's. Okay, so there's two to the n, potentially many different subsets of xi's, corresponding to the, yeah. So we can write it it's kind of compactly like this. The sum over all subsets s, n, of some coefficient, a real coefficient, we don't know what it is yet, um, times this monomial product over i and s of xi. Okay, that's what a generic multilinear polynomial in n xi's looks like. And let me just, uh, it's a little bit confusing, I'll put in parentheses over here. Um, product over i in empty set is, just means 1. Okay, so the, sort of the constant term is the case of s being the empty set by convention. Okay. And this expression is called the Fourier expansion of f. 
Okay, so that's where this Fourier analysis name comes in. Expansion or Fourier representation. Okay, and, you know, despite its name, it just means writing it as a, a real multilinear polynomial. And um, you know, because of this, we actually change the notation a little bit. So this uh, this C sub s, it doesn't show the dependence on f. So I'm going to do some erasing. Sorry if you're taking notes. Uh, instead of calling it C s, I'll call it um, f hat s. Okay. Well, this is just some uh, this is a real number. It's the real, and it's called the Fourier coefficient. of f, I don't know, at s or on s. Okay, okay so these um, real Fourier coefficients are associated to every function and they're uniquely defined. And it's just the coefficients in f's representation as a multilinear polynomial. And actually now it's maybe easier for you to believe that every, every function f into the reals has a unique such representation because in both cases, there's two to the n sort of uh, real degrees of freedom. You know, you have, for a generic Boolean function with range of the reals, you have two to the n real choices for the outputs. And here, for this kind of representation, there's two to the n uh, choices for the coefficients. So you can easily, easily believe that this gives you the uniqueness. Okay, any questions to this point? Is it possible to view the Fourier analysis of a uh, more complicated stuff like uh, group representation in the same polynomial framework as this one? Kind of, yeah. So this is like a very special case of like abstract harmonic analysis over the the um, the abelian group, which is like z two uh, to the n. Yeah. So um, yeah, whenever you have a abelian group, you'll have um, well complex polynomials that look like this. Yeah. Okay, I guess maybe while I'm here, let me, I don't know if I'll use this notation much, but in case I do, I'll use this notation, x to the s for this monomial. Okay, it's not much more compact, but a little bit. Okay, any other questions so far? Okay, so, um, right. Okay, so just to make sure that we're all on the same page, um, if we looked at, let's say, majority sub 3 hat of um, 1, 2, 3, that would be negative half. Okay, and majority sub 3 of um, empty set, that's the constant coefficient, which is 0. Etc. So if you have this expansion, you, it tells you the Fourier coefficients. Um, all right. Let me also look at another interesting function. Um, let's look at the Boolean function parity. Ben also talked about this function a lot. Let me write sub n on x. Um, this is a function which is uh, true if an odd number of the input bits are true. And so one, uh, actually the whole reason for this weird plus or minus one convention is just so that this will have this as its polynomial representation. Okay, you literally just take the product of all the bits. Okay, so in particular, um, that is an extremely simple representation. I mean, parity sub n hat of everything is one and otherwise these coefficients are zero. Okay, and actually, you see that. Um, well, let me make one more observation. Um, to sort of generalize this, you can look at the function. I'll call it parity sub s of x, which is just the parity of the bits, input bits, in subset s, which is a subset of the input bits. So you don't take the parity of all the bits. You take the parity of the bits that are in s. And as a multilinear polynomial, this is exactly this product i and s of xi. So what's nice is actually these terms here are themselves Boolean functions. They're parity functions on subsets of the bits. And this Fourier expansion is really about taking any generic function 
and writing it as a linear combination of parity functions, parity of subset functions. Okay. Great, so that's the Fourier expansion. And you might ask, that's very nice, but why, why do we care about this at all? I mean, what's the point of looking at the real representation? The point is essentially that um, it happens to be the case that many interesting sort of probabilistic, especially or combinatorial properties of a Boolean function f are reflected in the Fourier coefficients. So if you somehow compute the Fourier coefficients of a function, it can tell you several interesting properties of the function itself. Okay, so let me give an example of that now. So let me look at a very simple property of a Boolean function, which is its expectation. So I'm going to be talking a lot about probabilistic um, things. So let's look at the expectation over a randomly chosen x, a uniformly random x of uh, bits of f of x. Okay, so this is a uniformly random x. You, one way to think about it is for each of the n bits, you choose them independently to be plus or minus 1 with probability a half each. Um, so I'm going to do that and then take the expectation of f of, uh, take the expectation of f. So what is that equal to? Well, you count 1 when f is 1 and you count minus 1 otherwise, so it's the probability over a random x. So basically whenever you see a probability or an expectation over x, it's always going to be uniformly random. So it's the probability that f of x equals plus 1 minus the probability that f of x equals minus 1. Okay, so sort of the fraction of inputs whose output is false minus the fraction that's true. So it kind of measures how balanced or imbalanced uh, f is in terms of true and false. Okay, so for example, um, it's 0 if and only if, I guess, f is balanced, meaning it outputs true or false on half of the inputs each. Okay, so that's a very nice simple property that you might care about for a Boolean function, how biased it is. And it turns out that it's reflected in the Fourier coefficients of f very simply as well. So on one hand, that's what f is, but we can calculate this expectation in another way. So it's the expectation over a random x of, well, we just have this formula, f of x is this. Okay, so, I mean, um, I don't know, I can, it's f hat empty set plus f hat of the singleton 1 times x1 plus, you know, maybe there's f hat um, 3 comma 4 of x3, x4 plus etc. You know, the generic term looks like f hat of s times the product of the xi's for i and s. Okay, and what happens when we take the expectation here? Well, uh, we'll use linearity of expectation. This is just a constant, a real number, so it can come out, f hat empty set. Okay, and then what's left is the sum. I can also interchange the sum with the expectation. So the sum over all subsets s that are not the empty set of f hat s times, that's again just a constant, the expectation over x of this thing. Okay, so that's linearity of expectation. Now, uh, let's look at this term, this piece. So here we have an expectation of a product of things. And x1 through xn are independent by assumption. So if you have the expectation of a product of independent random variables, that's equal to the product of the expectations. That's one case when you really can switch them. So this is equal to the product over i and s of expectation over x of xi. And now this is quite simple. This, is, uh, this single thing is 1 with probability a half and minus 1 with probability a half. So its expectation is 0. So each thing in the product is 0. So the whole product is extra 0. It's very 0. And so every term here drops out. And overall, finally, you're just left with this constant coefficient. OK, so that's an, uh, this, you know, maybe the simplest example of how the Fourier coefficients tell you some things about the function. So if you just look at whatever the constant coefficient is, it tells you how biased or balanced the function is in terms of trues and falses. OK, questions about that? OK, 
Okay, let's do uh, some other examples. Uh, I guess I'll erase over here. So actually, this gives you an interpretation for one particular Fourier coefficient, the Fourier coefficient on the empty set. And I guess I can show you some interpretations of other coefficients. Um, so let's look at this. I'll write down this expression. Expectation, again, over random x of f of x times x1. Okay, which is kind of how correlated f is with the first coordinate, in a sense. So actually, one way I can write this is the following. See, this is plus or minus 1, f's output. I'm thinking of f as a Boolean valued function. x1 is plus or minus 1. So their product is 1 if they're the same, and it's minus 1 if they're different. So we count 1 uh, whenever f of x equals x1, and we count minus 1 whenever f of x does not equal, sorry, x1. Yeah. OK, so it's, it's like that, how correlated f of x is with the first input coordinate. Okay. So this is a somewhat natural quantity. But on the other hand, let's try to compute it this way with the Fourier coefficients. Um, <coughs> well, how can we get the, let's try to understand what is the Fourier expansion of this thing, f of x times x1. We just have to take this representation of f and multiply it by x1. So, I mean, what will happen? f of x times x1 will be f hat empty set times x1 plus f hat on the singleton set 1 times, well, x1 squared, but we can change x1 squared just to 1. Because x1, xi squared is always 1. So I'll rub that out. OK, and then some more things. Um, for example, f hat uh, 3, 4. That'll go to x1, x3, x4, et cetera. OK, so it'll be some other multilinear polynomial with the same coefficients, but somehow rearranged. And then what are we doing? We're taking the expectation of that. So we kind of saw what happened over here. Whenever you take the expectation of a multilinear polynomial, everything drops out except for the constant coefficient. Okay, so in this expression, everything will drop out except for the constant coefficient. But now the constant coefficient is this one. Right, that's the only one that doesn't have any x's attached to it. So therefore, we conclude that this is just f hat of the singleton one. OK, so the correlation of f with the first coordinate is you know, an interpretation of this Fourier coefficient. OK, in fact, you can kind of see something similar will happen um, for any coefficient. So for example, if s is some subset, we could look at um, the expectation over x of f of x times xs. And when you do this trick, when you multiply this expression by xs, all the terms will have at least one xi on them, except for where xs was itself. In that case, they'll all cancel out. Right? We actually have this relationship. xs times xt equals xs symmetric difference t. Um, which means that when you take the expectation, the single term that doesn't uh, drop out is f hat s. But on the other hand, we have the same fact as we have up here. Um, <coughs> this is plus or minus 1 always, and this is plus or minus 1 always. So the whole product is 1 if they're the same, and it's minus 1 if they're different. So this is also the probability over x that f of x equals I can write it this way, parity on the s bits of x minus the probability of the same thing, but that they're different. OK, so that's an interpretation of this uh, Fourier coefficient on s. It's how correlated f is with the parity on s function. <coughs> All right. Uh, let me do one more um, statement like this. 
Actually, if f and g are any functions, then on one hand, we can look at um, expectation of f of x, g of x. And this is the probability that f equals g on a random input minus the probability that they differ. Um, which actually, at some point, I'm going to use the fact that this is 1 minus the probability that they differ. So this is 1 minus 2 times the probability that they differ. This is all sort of the correlation of f and g. Um, on the other hand, I also claim that this has a Fourier expression, the sum over all subsets s of n of f hat s times g hat s. And why is that? It's kind of similar. I'll do a quick justification over here. So the expectation of f times g is, um, well, it's expectation over x, sum over s, f hat s, x s. That's the representation of f times sum over t, g hat t, x t. If I expand this all out, I'll get a lot of terms, sum over s and t, f hat s, g hat t, expectation of x s times x t, which is this. Okay, and as we see before, if you have the expectation of a product of the x i's, it's usually zero, unless it's the empty product. So this will be zero if s symmetric difference t is non-empty, and if it is empty, you'll get 1. So that's when s equals t. Okay, so most of the terms drop out. The only ones that don't drop out are when s equals t, and that's why you get this expression. Now this is a very uh, important property. I'll try to leave it up for a bit. It's called um, Parseval's equality. Okay, so it sort of says the correlation of f and g is given kind of by the correlation or like the inner product between their Fourier coefficients. And one important corollary of that is that um, for the case that we care about where f is a Boolean function, its range is plus or minus 1. This is what we care about most of the time. Well, we're going to take f equals g here. f of x times f of x is always 1. So this expectation is constantly 1. So we get the sum of the squares, the Fourier coefficients, equals 1. That's a kind of an amazing fact. You know, if you take any Boolean function and you turn it into a real valued polynomial, the Fourier expression, uh, the sum of the squares of the coefficients will always be 1. Okay, and that's a very useful fact. Um, in fact, it's kind of nice. It's a funny thing. These are some non-negative numbers that add up to 1. So you can think of them as a probability distribution. And it's a probability distribution uh, on subsets of n. So let me make a definition for that sometimes called a spectral sample. Okay, so given a Boolean function f, um, we'll say that the script s sub f is a set valued random variable. Defined by the probability that script S equals a fixed set capital S is f hat S squared. Okay, so it's an interesting idea. So for every Boolean function, you get a probability distribution on subsets of inputs. And somehow, at like some philosophical level, like the subsets that have high probability are like the sets of inputs that are important, input bits that are important to the function in some way. Okay, 
And sort of the additional philosophy a little bit is that um, a function f is sort of particularly simple if, I don't know, not many coordinates are too important to it, which is kind of like um, saying these sets s are typically small. So this is a super vague statement, but um, some kind of very vague philosophical statement. F is simple in some ways if the cardinality of this set is usually whatever that means and small, whatever that means. Okay, so SF is a random variable, but it's not a real value random variable. It's a random set. Okay, and so I need to tell you for each of the two to the n subsets, what's the ch called, you know, capital S, what's the chance that this script S takes on that set? And it's the squared Fourier coefficient. Okay, and that makes sense because it adds up to non-negative numbers adding up to one. So parity is a very complicated function. In some sense, parity is a very complicated function. It's a good example. So if f is parity, if f is parity of all the bits, oh, sorry, n, then uh, this random variable is not very random. It's always equal to all the numbers, well, 1 through n. Okay. Is the definition or a theorem I the end of the left-hand side? This? Yeah. It's a definition. So, so what is the equality at the end? This? Yeah. So I'm defining a probability distribution oh. on subsets. Okay, so if I want to define a probability distribution on objects, I give each one a probability which should be non-negative numbers adding up to one. And like luckily, whenever I have a Boolean function, it gives me a bunch of non-negative numbers that add up to one. One per subset of one through n. One per subset of input bits. So I just define a random variable that uh, takes on each of the subsets with the given probability. Yeah? Does that mean we can interpret the sum of the fs to the 4 as like the collision probability for uh, that distribution? Uh, we could, yeah. Mm -hmm. We could come up somewhere. I'm not sure if I've seen it, but I think actually Rocco studied exactly this in a paper with Parkshit and Avi and others. Okay, so let me uh, give a kind of application let me give a kind of application of studying Fourier analysis at all and sort of this philosophy to a computer science topic, namely learning theory. Okay, so this is like an application of Fourier analysis to learning theory. Okay, um, so what is learning theory all about? Like super briefly, you have some unknown Boolean function that you're trying to learn. Okay, so it's like somehow hidden in a black box. It's some unknown Boolean function. And how do you find out about it? You can get something called examples. You can get random examples. Okay, and what is a random example? You like hit a button and get a random example. It's just a random input plus f's value on that input. So a random input example is a pair, x, uh, a random string, and whatever f of x's value is. Okay. So the game in learning theory is you can ask for a bunch of random examples. And I should say that like the examples are uniform and independent. Okay, so you ask for an example, you get a random string and s value on it. Then you ask for another example, you get x value and a random, uh, a random x, another random x and s value on it. You keep asking for examples, and you're sort of trying to figure out what f is or reconstruct f. That's sort of the game in, in learning theory uh, under the uniform distribution. Now, um, off, quite often the game in uh, uh, Learning theory is the following. You see, you're not going to have a good time of learning if f is a completely arbitrary function, right? Because then seeing examples doesn't really help you infer what f's value is on other inputs. 
So you're usually trying to learn a simple function of some sort. Maybe it's simple in the sense that it has a shallow decision tree, or maybe it has a, a small size CNF or DNF, and you're hoping that that will help you learn the unknown function f, or approximately learn it from random examples. So if you feel that f is somehow a simple function, then the following sort of strategy might work. Strategy for somehow reconstructing a simple function f from random examples. One thing you can do is you can draw a bunch of examples and empirically estimate this quantity, expected value of x, f of x. You just draw a bunch of examples, see what f of x's value is, average them all up. Okay, and that'll give you some approximation of the empty set Fourier coefficient. Right? If you draw sort of enough samples, you'll probably get like estimate this quantity very accurately. Well, another thing you can do is empirically estimate this thing, the expectation over a random x of f of x times x1, which is the correlation of f with the first coordinate. Because again, you just draw a bunch of random x's, the example tells you f of x, and you know x1 yourself, so you just multiply them together and then take the overall average. And this is a very good estimate of f hat, uh, the singleton set 1. Okay, actually you can do this for any Fourier coefficient that you care to. For any fixed s, subset of coordinates, you can empirically estimate from the examples the expectation over x of f of x times this. Okay, so again, like this, the example tells you what this is, and this is, you can compute for yourself easily, and then you multiply it all together and take the empirical average. And this is a good estimate for f hat, oops, s. <coughs> okay, so, um, you know, one thing you could do is just try to estimate all the Fourier coefficients. Um, but there's two to the end of them, so I mean, that's going to take you a long time, a long number of samples. At that rate, you may as well have just tried to learn the truth table by writing down all the answers. But one strategy you can try is just to estimate some of the Fourier coefficients and hope that that gives you most of the function, or somehow that um, you collect up the, Fourier, the large Fourier coefficients, so f hat s. Okay. Um, so one strategy you can do, this is called the low degree algorithm in learning. And it was uh, introduced by Lineal Mansour and Nissan in 93. Uh, it's something you can always try. Um, just um, estimate in this way f hat s for all uh, sets s of small cardinality. Oops, k. Okay, for some parameter k of your choosing. And there's about n choose k or about n to the k such sets. And let's say, you know, with some polynomial number of samples, you estimate them to very good accuracy. Um, so this takes about something like n to the order k time. And now you just hope that if you pretend all the other Fourier coefficients are zero, that, that's a good approximation to f. So you just um, use as an approximate hypothesis you can say h of x which is the sum over all subsets s of a cardinality at most k f hat s well really your approximation to this quantity times x s Okay, so just take your approximations of the Fourier coefficients as if they were correct, and just uh, imagine all the other ones are zero. So, Ryan, yeah, is it important that you use fresh samples for each of your f hat s? It's not important. Yeah, um, but it doesn't really. I'm gonna not be not very careful at all about the um, running time, so maybe it'll affect this big O. But yeah, it's not important. Yeah. 
Uh, what is the connection between sampling from the spectral sample distribution and learning the function? Is it one easier than the other? Or? Um, yeah, I guess they're kind of totally different. Yeah. It's not so easy to, if you want to somehow sample from this, you have to kind of know which capital S's are such that f hat s is large. And that's not an easy thing to figure out if you just have random examples for a function f. But if you want to sample a, like a simple function, but the uh, coefficients are like for maybe of high degree, then somehow you have to guess which. Yeah, which is the challenge. So I guess that's a little bit like that. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so th what is the connection, or why did I bring this up in connection with learning? Um, the idea is, if for some reason you know that f is simple in this sense, and as I'll tell you later, like functions with small uh, decision trees or functions with small CNFs, um, they are simple in the sense that this random variable is usually small. What does that mean? It means that most of the, almost all the big Fourier coefficients are on small cardinality sets. It's kind of like f is almost a low degree function. Most of the large Fourier coefficients, remember these numbers when squared out up to one, maybe means that like if you sum over all the sets up to a given cardinality k of f hat s squared, that maybe that's 0.99 or something. And so all the remaining ones are very small. That's the hope, that if f is simple, It'll have most of its Fourier coefficients on large, uh, sorry, on small cardinality sets. And then this algorithm should hopefully work well. Um, for example, uh, one thing we saw is. Um, Function. Yeah, so good point. So this is actually a real valued function in general. And um, you could say that's OK. My hypothesis is real valued. But um, uh, you can also, if you want, take its sign. Yeah, I mean, what your hope is that like, this real number will be like, you know, very, very, very close to 1, like 0.99 for some inputs. And it'll be very, very close to minus 1 for the other inputs. That's your, your hope. Um, and so then taking the sign, for example, we'll round it to a truly Boolean function. Yeah, so for example, one thing, if you remember all the way back to the beginning, we saw that um, if f is a function whose decision tree depth is at most k, then if you think about f as a real polynomial, its degree is literally at most k. Okay? What does that mean? It means that um, f hat s is literally 0 for all subsets s of cardinality bigger than k. Which in particular means that this algorithm, I mean, if you kind of know that the decision tree depth is at most some k, I chose the same k for a reason, um, this algorithm will almost work exactly, OK? Because there are no Fourier coefficients to learn of cardinality bigger than k. OK, so it's just enough to really estimate all the coefficients of degree less than or equal to k very carefully, closely. Another way to say exactly this same statement is to say that um, the probability that this spectral sample set is of size bigger than k is exactly 0. Okay, these are the same statements. Okay, so um, let me uh, sort of say a theorem that's true about this low degree algorithm. <coughs> so, so I you know, won't do the analysis, but it's very uh, easy to prove this theorem. Um, suppose you somehow know that f has the following property. If you sum over all sets s of cardinality bigger than k of f hat s squared, that's very small. It's at most epsilon. Okay, so again, these numbers are non-negative. They add up to 1. Think of epsilon as very, very small. And this is saying like almost all of the non-zero stuff is at degree at most k. 
Okay? That's the, sort of exactly the case in which you hope that this will be a great strategy for learning f, and indeed it's, it's not hard to show that that's the case, then f is learnable. I won't exactly say what this means, but it basically means what you think. The accuracy order epsilon in polynomial and n to the k and 1 over epsilon uh, time and samples. Yeah, it just means you, know, you have to take enough samples so that you well uh, approximate all the low degree Fourier coefficients. And then this sort of tells you that don't, you don't have to worry about the coefficients on sets of cardinality bigger than k. Yep. So this also implies some kind of robustness property that if I get my Fourier coefficients approximately right, then I get the function approximately right. I mean, that's a, yeah, you have to take care. a separate argument. Yeah, you have to take a little bit of care to prove that, yeah. But it's true. Yeah. And it follows actually from this Parseval theorem that I erased, if you want to try to prove it as an exercise. Um, right, so in particular, I mean, uh, well, let me, um, I'll, I'll stop in one second, but uh, let me just write down a couple more things. Another way to say this is the exact same thing, this is literally exactly the same as saying probability that the spectral sample set is bigger than k is at most epsilon. It's the same statement. Um, in this case with decision trees of depths k, it's kind of like you can take epsilon equals zero. Um, so for this corollary, you actually need even more slightly elaborated uh, arguments along uh, what Jakob was talking about. But it, you can take my word for it that it is a corollary of this fact that um, sort of the class or like any depth k decision tree, or if you just promise that you're trying to learn an unknown function, but somebody promises you it has a depth k decision tree, it's learnable in poly uh, n to the k time. Okay, so for you know one nice class is decision trees of depth log n, and this gives you a quasi polynomial time algorithm for learning them, which I guess is the best thing known. Uh, yeah, actually, if you put on an extra argument, which I don't have time to say, then actually you can learn it exactly, exactly. It's a property that a depth k decision tree is every Fourier coefficient is an integer multiple of 2 to the minus k. You can actually see why that is from the original arguments. And therefore, it suffices to estimate them up to an error of like 2 to the minus k, and you can do that by losing a factor of 2 to the k here, which you're already losing anyway. Yep? Does that mean basically that learning a function uh, is equivalent to actually learn uh, in that distance, in Hamming distance, is equivalent to learning the spectral distribution in total variation? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just write down one more uh, example of this and then I'll stop. Uh, here's another fact that we'll prove maybe in the second half. We'll prove this theorem. If f is a monotone function, in the classic sense of a monotone Boolean function, it's a fact that uh, the probability that the spectral sample is bigger than uh, square root n over epsilon is at most epsilon. Okay? In other words, all but epsilon of its Fourier mass or Fourier spectrum is on levels below root n over epsilon. So this is very easy to prove with Fourier analysis. It's a corollary. I guess Bashudi and Timon were the first to prove this. You know, monotone functions are learnable in time and samples. Well, n to the this, so n to the order root n over epsilon. Okay, so it's you know like exponential and root n. So it's not amazing, but it's sub-exponential time, and this is a very wide class of functions. So accuracy is less than one uh, the accuracy for this would be just epsilon, order epsilon. Uh, and I guess actually, I mean, I'm not sure what the deal is with the dependence on epsilon, but this uh, 2 to the root n time is actually required to learn monotone functions as well. So this is basically sharp. It's yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, you guys probably know. 
Okay, so uh, let me stop there and next time we'll see more about how you can prove things like this. I mean, this motivates us to try to prove that functions, simple functions have simple Fourier spectra.